Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, I know we are on the tail end uh, and final stretch of the uh, conference, so um, we're all tired. We want to go on our planes and go home, but uh, I do appreciate you um, sitting in and attending this. Um, my name is Savannah Mom. I'm the executive producer of a digital XR firm uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so, yeah, central Pennsylvania, um, in the East Coast. And yeah, we're, we're known actually for more than just Amish, um, which there are a lot of Amish in uh, Lancaster, but uh, there's a lot of horses there too. Um, but we do have a very tech savvy uh, industry out in Lancaster, as well as uh, the fact, well, for the fact that we're about an hour and a half uh, west of Philadelphia. And so Philadelphia has been really kind of progressively uh, on the cutting edge of, of tech in the East Coast. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our experience working with the Beers Cup World Championship and how we kind of helped elevate um, gambling, so to speak, and wagering um, using uh, XR technology such as VR and computer vision. Um, but to kind of give you a little bit of backstory on who we are as a company, um, like I said, we're based in Lancaster. We primarily focus on um, digital activations, XR activations for live events. Um, some of our clients in the past, and we've been very fortunate to work with some giants such as um, Dick Clark Productions, Billboard Music Awards, uh, World Youth Day. We actually worked with the Vatican. Uh, we were the very first company, very first team, and I can probably say this. Uh, we partnered with Nokia, uh, Nokia Ozo, to actually broadcast live Pope Francis, um, the first team to ever do that uh, in Krakow, Poland. So we did that for the Nokia Ozo, um, for the United States Catholic Church. Um, we've also worked with um, baseball teams such as the Philadelphia Phillies and, and others. So we're, we're kind of entrenched in live events. Um, we believe that live events is, is, is the future of uh, where I think VR and potentially AR can take off, um, creating meaningful fan engagement. Um, so let me give you a little bit of, of a, a backstory on the Breeders' Cup for those who are not really familiar with um, horse racing. Uh, Breeders' Cup World Championship is an annual sporting event that's uh, held um, every year in November, um, and it basically ends the thoroughbred horse racing season. Uh, it's considered a Grand Slam event um, if there is a Triple Crown winner. So the last and only Grand Slam uh, winner uh, was, um, and I'm going to draw a blank on it, uh, it wasn't Justify, it was um, American Pharaoh, 2015. Um, so, obviously winning the Kentucky Derby, the Belmont, the Preakness, and then Breeders' Cup. So American Pharaoh was the only horse to ever do that. Um, and it's also the richest two days in sports. So it's uh, $30 million in prize money um, in 2018 was given away uh, at the Breeders' Cup. So they had called us up. Um, their CEO uh, called us up and asked us to come to Lexington, Kentucky because they had challenges. Um, the Breeders' Cup is the governing body. It's uh, not really the governing body, but it's the nonprofit that actually represents all of thoroughbred horse racing in the United States. Um, they have also outreaching tentacles all across the world. But their job and their mission is to really kind of push horse racing and thoroughbred breeding, um, you know, per uh, progressively forward uh, into the future. Um, and so their challenges when they came to us was like, look, guys, we need to figure out how to progressively push our traditionally conservative sport uh, to a new digitally minded audience. Um, in the United States, uh, the statistics are the majority of uh, people who attend or uh, are wagering on a consistent basis are 50 to 60 years old and higher. Um, a very small percentage at this point in time in the United States are uh, millennials um, and Generation Z. Um, they wanted to utilize new technologies to enrich, enrich the fan experience to the sport. So how do we use VR, AR, XR to really enhance the fan experience? Um, like any other live event uh, or sporting uh, event, how do you create new sponsorship opportunities? How do you create uh, meaningful return on investments uh, for brands who want to connect their, uh, their product to, uh, uh, for at least Breeders' Cup, a very lucrative, uh, wealthy uh, fan base? Um, and most importantly for them, and they won't say this, but I will, because um, I'm not really part of Breeders' Cup. Uh, they'll say that really at the end of the whole day, it's all about increasing volume of wages globally. Um, 
I mean, all the tradition and all the, the pomp and circumstances is excellent, um, but it doesn't really mean anything if no one is wagering on the sport. Um, so that's how, you know, they make money. That's how they pay bills. Um, well, in addition to the, the breeding, which comes afterwards. But we uh, then, from a, from a thought perspective, we were like, well, look, let's, before we go and pitch them you know, some crazy ideas, let's go and talk to their audience. Let's, let's, let's under their, understand their audience. And I think that's a, a common mistake that a lot of, um, I, I would say, individuals who are in the tech world uh, tend to make is that we a lot of times get so enamored by the technology that we forget about the end user, the people who are actually going to be using it. Um, and for us, we wanted to fully understand the audience before we created a solution for them because you could have a shiny metal ball, but if no one plays with it, it doesn't mean anything. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, in the United States, we saw that you know, the, the leading age group uh, of uh, handicappers were 50 and, uh, and over. Um, strangely enough, in the United Kingdom, um, millennials were leading the charge. Um, we, we think it's more of a cultural thing. Um, but the good thing that we saw was that 60 plus percent of wages came from online and mobile. So people were actually accessing their phones, going online and making wages. Um, and that showed a, you know, obviously, yes, you might be 50 years and older, but you were using your smartphone in, in some capacity. Um, we had talked to folks at racetracks, and the one thing that we heard from a lot of folks was that, you know, as on-site users, um, if you get a betting book on the day of the race, a lot of times those betting books with the odds and statistics are usually three days old. And for a lot of folks who don't understand handicapping, it is really an art. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to kind of uh, promote gambling or in the stretch, but what we've seen is unlike chance betting, where it's kind of you know, going to a casino and you're just betting on uh, whether, you're, whether you get blackjack or not, in horse racing, a lot of it is an art, going to the track for the, a, a well-versed handicapper to be able to go, to study the horse, see the horses, take all the numbers of their past wins, losses, all that factors in to make a qualified, educated bet, um, or guess, so to speak. Um, and so what a lot of uh, on-site users were telling us that you know, the betting books were, were not up to date. Um, you have a lot of scratches, there's information that came out, because a lot of the books were printed three days, three, four days, days in advance. So um, they wanted up-to-date current odds. Um, and if you were going to an off-track wagering site, because uh, a lot of the, the wages are done globally um, and not even so much on-site, uh, a lot of individuals, handicappers, would tell you that they hated watching uh, the simulcast because you're limited to what, you can sh what the director wants to s show you. So I'll give you, for example, um, majority of people who are not true handicappers, that don't handicap on a week-to-week, on -week, day-to-day basis, um, the one event that most people, the common person knows about is the Kentucky Derby. Um, it's the one grand event that uh, most Americans knows about. And it's, for me, I mean, personally speaking, before I even got involved in, in this, that's the only day I would actually even gamble. And I didn't know anything about horse racing. I would just go and say, I like horse number eight because I like the pink saddle towel and he's 10 to one. And I just threw $20 and you know, if I win, great. If I don't, whatever. Um, but the true handicapper wants to know what the horses look like. So if you're watching Kentucky Derby broadcast, if you ever watch the Kentucky Derby broadcast on TV, they spend maybe three to four minutes talking about the horses. Maybe, I'm sorry, not maybe, maybe 10, 15 percent talking about the horses. And the rest of the time, they're talking about culture, cultural things. Who's wearing what? What are they drinking? It's all about the lifestyle. But for someone who's about to bet $1,000 or $5,000, you want to watch the horses every moment. So those were some of the challenges that we were hearing from audiences. Um, so we asked ourselves, and we w basically asked um, you know, the Breeders' Cup, what if, what if we could create a platform that is the Netflix to Blockbuster for the horse racing world? So what does that mean? Um, Netflix, basically, the video on demand service, and everyone probably has it or is very familiar with it, basically destroyed Blockbuster. Um, the brick and mortar system of having DVDs is basically extinct and useless. Uh, and what we thought was, what if we could do the same for racing? And uh, what I mean by that is, 
let's eliminate off-track wagering sites because physically the brick and mortar system is it's, it's expensive to maintain. But what if you could immerse people digitally across the world into a track and be able to give them educated, immersive views of horse racing and horses in real time with real information. So we decided to put together a pitch video. Um, I, I come from a broadcast background, so I love sizzle reels, I love trailers. Um, it jazzes me up to watch a movie, so we created this little sizzle reel to kind of present to the Breeders' Cup to get them excited. So it was very X-Men-like, get them excited, you know? <laughs> um, so they loved it, and they were like, damn, how do we do that? So um, our North Star vision, and so for those who are not familiar with that terminology, North Star vision, um, we see, you know, this is the goal that we want to get to. Um, it could be five, 10 years down the road, but how do we take the baby steps to slowly get there? Um, so our North Star vision to them was, let's create a virtual community where race fans can transport themselves and immerse themselves into any racetrack in the world and be able to handicap any race at any time, like if there's a race, in real time. Um, because what we've learned was that a, a true handicapper, a, a person who is into, into in horse racing, the red carpet, so to speak, is the paddock area. That's where they like to spend their time. Like if you watch any race, you'll see people congregate to the paddock area to kind of really watch and study the horses. Um, that's where you can tell if a horse is going to run well um, or it's sweating and you know, there's a lot of terminology that I have to be self-honestly admit that I don't really, I'm not familiar with, but a handicapper gets it when they see the horse in person. So that was our vision. You know, what if you could create a community where online or digitally that you can transport yourself to any racetrack around the world? Um, so our strategy to them was, look, let's, before we jump in head first, and I think, again, as I was saying earlier, we wanted to make sure that this was a viable path that we were gonna create for them. Um, give the user a reason to want to use it. Um, just throwing out VR and AI, you know, doesn't mean crap to most people unless they have a reason to use it. Um, we found out that, as most of you will understand, and you know this, that make it a shared experience. Make it a communal experience. Let people have the opportunity to talk to each other if they can. Um, create conversations around that. Um, we live in such a digitally, socially minded world that people love to share. You know, create some kind of community where people are talking about it. Um, more importantly, you gotta train consumers. It's not gonna happen overnight. And that was one thing we planted in their heads. Um, consumer behaviorism is really important in my, in my opinion. Uh, it's gonna be a long-term play. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna see it happen next year or in two years it takes baby steps to kind of get to the, to the eventual goal, so to speak. Um, and to kind of get there, 
make it relatable. Um, I think a lot of people, the end user, especially now when I talk about the end user here being 50 and plus, are some of them are kind of afraid to kind of immerse themselves in the new technology. Um, create something that they are used to seeing. And so what we thought is, look, let's create a broadcast, create content that's meaningful to them. So a story, something they've seen before. Um, so we decided to come up with a live VR broadcast, which at face value doesn't seem that exciting. I mean, it's been done before, but we looked at it from a, okay, look, easy point of entry. We know that Facebook 360 is pushing out live stuff uh, in, in VR, or in 360, I should say. YouTube 360 is a great platform. Um, we were able to put it on Oculus VR Live, and so our thought was to them, let's create a live VR broadcast. The challenge in all that is that VR is not exactly, it, it, uh, it's not exactly perfect, uh, it's not a good solution for a racetrack that is the size of a, you know, I mean, most of you are familiar with racetracks, they're massive in size. And VR really is powerful when you're close to something. So a sport like the NBA, basketball, is more conducive to, to VR. I mean, you are center court, LeBron James is walking by you, you feel like you're there. Where in horse racing, you're on, this, you know, on, the, on the home stretch, but the horses are a mile away, and in VR, it doesn't really appeal to anyone. So we were thinking to ourselves, we're not sure if this is gonna work. Um, and we kind of came up with the concept, like, let's, let's give them things to look at in the world. So this was a concept pitch to them. Um, what if we had social in, in the feed? What if we had a live stream of a broadcast going on? What if we had post time information in there? Um, and an opportunity for them to kind of fill in like in the world. So this was a conceptual drawing that we had for them that they were interested in. Um, but then what we, we determined was it wasn't really helping the handicapper. And we ultimately decided to kind of limit the broadcast to focusing primarily on the, the paddock area. Um, we want to do more than VR, so we um, partnered up with a, 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 our solutions um, development partner, uh, Cezanne, who's uh, Chuck, the president's here. Hi, Chuck. Um, who helped us create a computer vision, artificial intelligence platform um, for the VR. And this was kind of the first step for what we imagine as the future uh, of where handicapping and horse racing will go to. Um, so the, the concept around having the computer vision was um, we wanted you, and as I think you saw in the earlier videos, we wanted you while you're in the world to have horses walk by in certain areas while you're in the paddock, and we were able to actually pull real data from Equibase and get real-time information that would pop up on the screen, overlay onto the VR world, um, which was being implemented as phase one of this activation. Um, so this was a concept drawing, which ended up being kind of the final version, but we decided that in the 360 world, because that's what we were gonna focus on in the 360 world, and if you had a VR headset, great, but in the 360 world, knowing that majority of the audience that's going to first try to accept this will be, will be watching it via Facebook 360 or YouTube 360, um, we created a computer vision zone where we actually, and we'll talk a little bit about the development process, um, had horses would walk by through the zone and we trained the computer to actually recognize the saddle number, recognize the horse, and paired up with the real-time Equibase data and give you real-time information overlay on the screen as it happened in real time in front of you. So some of the development process challenges that we had as, as a team kind of came up with is when they initially were looking at doing this, and oh, I should probably also throw this to you, the Creators Cup gave us the okay to do this in September, I think, um, and the event was in end of October. So we had about a month and a half, two months to try to figure this out. Um, so our team, development team, looked at Microsoft, Amazon, and Google machine learning platforms, and they found that uh, cloud-based latency was way too slow. Uh, um, and what we did not want to do is, at this early stage, was kind of have 30 seconds, 40 seconds of latency between the broadcast and the actual uh, VR sh bro broadcast. So we wanted to try to get as close to real time without with having some sort of delay in place. Um, so cloud-based was not the, the, the solution, and I'll kind of walk through more part of it. Um, we needed to develop our own custom training solution that worked locally. So the team, the development team, actually created their own platform, so to speak, that worked locally on the computer. Um, well, we had to supplement our GPU processing power to using AWS Cloud GPU 
to train enough iterations of our model in short turnaround. Um, so we basically had to pump in more computing power than we uh, expected. Um, and in about a month and a half, two months, we, we had to dig and find 50,000 photos and videos of, of horses, but primarily horses uh, at Churchill Downs at the paddock area um, in all types of weather, all types of lighting situations. And fortunately, the challenge in this was the Breeders' Cup, like the Kentucky Derby, will usually have up to 16 or 21 horses run. Most races only have eight to 10 horses at most, maybe 12. So to try to find a race that has 16 to 21 saddle towels that you can train the computer was extremely difficult. Um, so uh, our team was very resourceful. Chuck's team well, went out and above and beyond to kind of find the imagery to make it work. Um, and they literally worked up to the, the night of the, before the event, just busting their butt off to make it happen. Um, from an on-site information uh, standpoint, we partnered with uh, Insta360 to strategically place three Insta360 Pro cameras around the track. Um, we had one uh, on the paddock, we had one on the back stretch, we had one on uh, the finish line. Um, again, we were focused on latency, so we partnered with uh, finally, thank you, uh, Sweden, a uh, Swedish company called Voices to broadcast out our uh, 2K with 12 seconds latency. So we ended up getting 12 seconds of latency, but it still was uh, worked into our favor. Um, the other challenge was that they wanted, Breeders' Cup wanted to stream this multiple platforms. So they wanted to stream it to Breeders' Cup website, they wanted to stream it to Facebook 360, YouTube 360, Twitter, as well as their mobile app and the Oculus headset. So we uh, partnered with Wowza to make that happen. Um, and our team actually had to go down to Churchill Downs four times um, and to work with NBC Sports to kind of do this creative song and dance on how to make this work um, and not get in their way but at the same time create a meaningful broadcast. So we actually hired a um, on-camera talent who helped you guide you through the world. Um, we really wanted to create a broadcast and show kind of for anyone who's coming into it for the first time to really understand what the heck was going on. So we actually hired a, a horse racing expert. Um, this was kind of how it happened. Uh, we actually pulled in the, um, the Churchill Down simulcast. We had the talent cam. We had two 360 cameras that were going straight to the broadcast team. At the bottom, you see the Paddock 360 camera sending the feed directly to computer vision, which is feeding information from Equibase that would send up to the broadcast team again, which was then sent and encoded to Wowza, which then platformed it out to four um, different or five different uh, uh, pla uh, streaming uh, platforms. So the other challenge that we did not consider until we got there was weather. Um, weather sucks when you're trying to do an outdoor event in 360. Uh, and what we found out was Insta360 doesn't have waterproofing cameras. Um, so we were trying to be clever. Um, I mean, we, we, we tried using condoms. <laughs> condoms are too small for these cameras and that didn't work. Um, so and if you watch the Kentucky Derby, I mean, damn, it rains all the time. And so we were scared, like deathless. And of course, we were there rehearsing and it rained every time we were there rehearsing. Um, so we made this makeshift rain cap that all it did was protect the, the computing processing power up there. It didn't really protect the, la the lens, but it did a good enough job. So it kind of looks like a yarmulke uh, on, on uh, the rain cap. So, and it worked because it did sprinkle and fortunately it didn't blur the, the imagery. Um, and this is the end result. Um, the video is kind of like a, a little case study, but we did end up being the number one live stream uh, on Breeders' Cup YouTube channel uh, with watch time. Uh, averaging 11 and a half minutes uh, uh, of watch time. The average watch time on YouTube was about uh, three and a half minutes, so we kind of tripled that. Um, again, but it was a four hour broadcast, but what we saw was people were coming in ebbs and flows. Um, it had a 108% increase in total watch time as compared to the flat live stream version, so they actually had both live streams going um, at the same time. So they had a traditional live stream, and then they had the VR going at the same time, and we actually outbeat the traditional one. We actually had more people watching the VR one. Um, we had 77% increase in concurrent viewers compared to their second best live stream. So we had at one point 8,000 viewers watching at one time, and it was at the last race. And we've also found out that it was a global community. People were watching it from like China, people were watching from England. Um, so it was really cool to see that there was this global community kind of watching it on YouTube, and they were all chatting with each other, which was really cool. Um, and on Facebook, we noticed that 23% uh, of the viewership was the coveted 25 to 34 digital uh, generation that they were trying to seek. Um, 
So did it move the needle? Uh, so yes, we'd like to say, because um, Joan Champy, who's pictured here, she is, was our consulting uh, producer. Uh, she was an ESPN horse racing producer, and she was a technical producer on the uh, Steven Spielberg movie Sea Biscuit. She sat there with us, and she basically, I could tell on the very first day, was like, oh, this is crazy, this is stupid, nobody's gonna watch this. By the end of the five hours, she was so excited, she basically said, this is like watching a bunch of nerds in a, watching the moon landing, and she's basically like, this is going to change the way people view horse racing. So, our takeaways from it, as I kind of wrap up, um, we are, we're gonna move forward with the Breeders' Cup um, on other iterations of this, as we go into phase two, is we're gonna do less stream time. Um, people, if you ever watched the horse racing, people will congregate during the horse racing to watch the horses. As soon as the horses are done, everyone goes away, goes to the bathroom, and they're you know, making their next bets. So we noticed the same thing during the live stream. People will come in, then they'll go out. Come in and come out. So declutter the screen, create less stream time. Um, plan more time for computer vision training. We want to create more social engagement in the world. Um, and we also had a lot of missed sponsorship opportunities. So I'm getting the wrap up. Um, so our next steps is we're, we're looking now to work with Chuck's team is to create almost an alt space platform. Like I mentioned, the goal five years from now is to one day put on a headset and be able to transport yourself into any track around the world using VR um, and basically seeing computer vision in a handy, in a, in a um, plat, I was called a little paddock area to make able bets. Um, so if you have any questions, I know I kind of rushed to the end, sorry. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is on there behind my image, if you want to take my image off. But um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it was quick.